Welcome to the inaugural episode of Drinking History. These episodes are going to be a little bit more inconsistent than Tasting History. A little bit more casual and uh, not as probably not as frequent as Tasting History and they're going to hopefully be shorter. Sometimes we'll talk about what drink we're making or the history of uh, some, something tied to it and sometimes it won't have anything to do with what we're drinking. It's just a story from history. But we will cover the history of cocktails, spirits, wine, beer, as well as coffee, tea, hot chocolate, and other beverages from history. But for this first episode, I need a cocktail. So we're going to be making a green room and discussing the man in the green hat, this time on Drinking History. So this recipe for a green room comes from The Green Cocktail Book by Jimmy. Just Jimmy. Jimmy, late of Cicero's, but just Jimmy. It was published in London in 1932 and includes many of the cocktails that were popular in America during Prohibition, which was in its waning days. The recipes in the book are wonderfully simple, for as Jimmy says, Here you will find nothing having to do with jiggers nor gills. All such occult references have been abandoned, and you will find that your favorite drink's makeup is listed in terms of parts. And the parts he calls for are one part brandy, Two parts French vermouth, now this is going to be a dry vermouth, not your typical Italian sweet vermouth. And two dashes of curacao per cocktail. This would be orange curacao. They did have red and green and blue curacao at the time, but if it doesn't specify a color, then it's just orange curacao. So chill a cocktail glass with some ice water, and then fill a mixing glass with ice. Then add one part brandy, two parts vermouth, and the curacao, and stir. Then empty the glass and use a strainer to pour the cocktail. Now he mentions no garnish, so cheers. Oh, that's nice. It's actually kind of fruity. That uh, curacao really, really punches through. You get the smoothness from the brandy. I used a cognac. That's what I like. Uh, but, but that that orange really, really pops. But then it dies away. It's very smooth, like. Not just flavor-wise, but almost mouthfeel-wise. Almost as if, if we had some sort of syrup in there, which we don't. Though, some drinks do have gum syrup, which I, I really, really like that. This one doesn't. It doesn't taste very alcoholic, so this could really sneak up on you. I'm glad that I only made one, except I didn't. I actually made two. Also, there is like a slight drying effect. Uh, it it kind of dries the mouth just a little bit. A little pucker but I like that. Now, I don't know why it's called the green room, seeing as I don't think that's green. I'm kind of colorblind, but pretty sure that's not green. One theory I have is that it's actually named after the green room in the White House, because that was traditionally where you served cocktails before a state dinner. Don't know, but let's go with that story for today, especially because it ties into the history that we're talking about, which is the man in the green hat who would have had an office just down the way from the green room in the White House. From 1920 until 1933, booze was forbidden in the U.S. of A, and that went for everyone, including Congress, at least for the first couple months. Because by the end of 1920, George Cassidy had an office in the Cannon House office building. Now, was George a member of Congress? No. Perhaps a secretary or a liaison? Not so much. No, George was a bootlegger. A friend of mine told me that liquor was bringing better prices on Capitol Hill than anywhere else in Washington, and that a living could be made supplying the demand. And supply he did. In fact, some of his very first customers were people who just months before had voted for the 18th Amendment and the Folstead Act, which banned alcohol. For five years, he supplied the house with rum and whiskey and pretty much any liquor that they wanted until 1925, when he was arrested in connection with the leaving of a suitcase with four quarts of whiskey at the house office building. Now, he had been wearing a green felt hat at the time, and so the newspapers just referred to him as the man in the green hat, and the name kind of stuck. And he pretty much just got a slap on the wrist, but he was soured against the entire experience, especially with the House of Representatives. So he did what any good bootlegger would do and moved to the Senate. See, in the House, he worked directly with the congressmen, but at the Senate, he said that they were more discreet, and most of the senators would order their liquor through their secretaries. Though he did admit that you find a more general spirit of good fellowship and conviviality in the House. So for the next five years, he supplied the Senate with hooch until he got arrested in 1930, this time getting 18 months in prison, except that he was able to sign himself out in the evening so he could go home to sleep, which 
Kind of reminds me of Otis on Andy Griffith. Did anyone else watch that show? But he agreed to stop bootlegging and instead became a writer. And in October of 1930, he ran a series of articles in the Washington Post basically outlining what he had been doing for the last decade. And without giving any specific names, he basically said that four out of five congressmen had bought from him and that, considering that I took the risk and did the legwork from 1920 to 1930, I am more than willing to let the general public decide how I stack up with the senator or representative who ordered the stuff and consumed it on the premises or transported it to his home. And the public did decide, because a week later, during the midterm elections, they voted out the mostly dry Republican majority and replaced it with a wet Congress, a Democratic Congress at the time. Took a little while longer, but that did eventually end prohibition in the U.S. And thank goodness that they did, because, well, I wouldn't be doing drinking history if they hadn't, or at least it would be a very short series. Now, as this is new, I would love any feedback that you have on the setup, the lighting, which is definitely a work in progress, but also the actual show itself, tasting notes, you know, anything at all. I am all ears. I would also love to hear about any drinks or historical stories, whether they have to do with liquor or not, that uh, you want covered here on Drinking History. Anything is up for grabs. But until then, I leave you with this wonderful quote from the Rubiat of Omar Khayyam. While you live, drink. For once dead, you never shall return. See you next time on Drinking History.